the gods. Zeus. Kronos, father of the gods, who gave his name to time, married his sister Rhea, goddess of earth. Now Kronos had become king of the gods by killing his father Uranus, the first one, the dying Uranus, prophesied, saying you murder me now and steal my throne, but one of your own sons will dethrone you, for crime begets crime so Kronos was a very careful. One by one is swallowed his children as they were born, first three daughters, Hestia, Demeter, and Hera, then two sons Hades and Poseidon. One by one he swallowed them all. Rhea was furious. She was determined that he should not eat her next child, who she felt sure would be a son. When her time came she crept down the slope of Olympus to a dark place to have her baby. And it was a son, and she named him Zeus. She hung a golden cradle from the branches of an olive tree and put him to sleep there. Then she went back to the top of the mountain. She took a rock and wrapped it in swaddling clothes and held it to her breast, humming a lullaby. Kronos came snorting and bellowing out of his great bed and snatched the bundle from her and swallowed it. Rhea ran down the mountainside to the swinging golden cradle and took her son down into the fields. She gave him to a shepherd family to raise promising that their sheep would never be eaten by wolves. Here Zeus grew to be a beautiful young boy and Cronus his father knew nothing about him. Finally however, Rhea became lonely for him and brought him back to the court of the gods, introducing him to Cronus as the new cup bearer. Cronus was pleased because the boy was beautiful. One night Rhea and Zeus prepared a special drink. They mixed mustard and salt with the nectar. Next morning, after a mighty swallow, Kronos vomited up first a stone, then Hestia, Demeter, Hera, Hades and Poseidon, who being gods were still undigested and still alive. They thanked Zeus and immediately chose him to be their leader. Raged, Kronos was joined by the Titans, his half-brothers. Huge, twisted, dark, creatures, taller than trees, whom he kept pent up in the mountains until there was fighting to be done. They attacked the young gods furiously. But Zeus had allies too. He had gone to darker caverns, caves under caves, under caves, deep in the mountainside, formed by the first bubbles of the cooling earth. Here, Kronos, thousands of centuries before, a short time in the life of a god, pent up other monsters, the one-eyed Cyclops and the hundred-handed ones. Zeus unshackled these ugly cousins and led them against the Titans. There was a great rushing in the skies. The people on earth heard mighty thunder and saw mountains shatter. The earth quaked and tidal waves rolled as the gods fought. The Titans were as tall as trees and old Kronos was a crafty leader. He attacked fearlessly, driving the young gods before him. But Zeus had laid a trap. Halfway up the slope of Olympus, he whistled for his cousins, the hundred-handed ones who had been lying in ambush. They took up huge boulders, one hundred each, and hurled them downhill at the Titans. The Titans thought the mountain itself was falling on them. They broke ranks and fled. The young goat god Pan was shouting with joy. Later he said that it was his shout that made the titans flee. That is where we get the word. Panic. Now the young gods climbed to Olympus and took over the castle, and Zeus became their king. No one knows what happened to Kronos and his titans, but sometimes mountains still shake and explode in fire. And the earth still quakes and no one knows exactly why. Hera In ancient Greek mythology, the daughter of the Titans Kronos and Rhea, sister and wife of Zeus and queen of the Olympian gods, the Romans identified her with their own Juno. Hera was worshipped throughout the Greek world and played an important part in Greek literature, appearing most frequently as the jealous and rancorous wife of Zeus and pursuing with vindictive hatred the heroines, who were beloved by him. From early times Hera, 
was believed to be the sole unlawful wife of Zeus. She soon superseded Dione. Who shared with him is ancient oracle of the Dodina in Epirus. In general, Hera was worshipped in two main capacities. One, as a consort of Zeus and two, as the goddess of marriage and of the life of women. The second sphere naturally made her the protectress of women in childbirth, and she bore the title of Ilathea, the birth goddess, at Argos and Athens. At Argos and Samos, however, Hera was even more than queen of heaven and marriage goddess. She was patron of those cities, which gave her a position corresponding to that of Athena at Athens. Although her age of ritual was markedly agricultural, she also had a celebration there called the Shield, and there was an armed procession in her honor at Stamos. This conception resulted in the breadth of functions attributed to the patron deity of a Greek state. A city goddess must be chief in peace and war alike. The animal especially sacred to Hera was the cow. Her sacred bird was the kaku and later the peacock. She was represented as a majestic and severe, though youthful matron. Based on the number of cults, Hera was a very ancient goddess, possibly predating even Zeus. In fact, it's assumed that we don't even know her original name. Hera is actually a title, which is usually translated as lady or mistress. Hera's Roman counterpart was Juno, the goddess who gave her name to the month of June, and even today the most popular time for weddings. Hera was usually portrayed alongside Zeus as a fully clothed matronly woman of solemn beauty, wearing a cylindrical crown called polos, or a wreath and a veil. Sometimes she carries a scepter capped with a pomegranate and a cuckoo, the former a symbol of fertility, the latter a token of the way she was wooed by Zeus. She is also often accompanied by a peacock, one of her sacred animals. Being born after Hestia and Demeter, Hera is the youngest of Cronus and rears three daughters and the third child overall. Hades, Poseidon and Zeus in that order are her younger brothers however, since just like each of her siblings, but Zeus, she was swallowed by her father at birth and later disgorged to be born again. She is sometimes referred to as Cronus and Rhea's oldest daughter, reasonably, since the Titan had to empty his stomach of his children in the order opposite of the one in which he ate them. As the guardian of marriage, and the spouse of the king of gods and men, Hera, didn't have much choice but to be a faithful wife, even though she was beautiful. Not many men, and not one god dared to lay hands on her. Endymion tried once, but Zeus condemned him to eternal sleep. Ixion fared, even worse. Zeus fooled him into making love with a cloud, fashion and Hera's image, and then ordered Hermes to bind him to the perpetually turning wheel of fire. By most accounts, Hera gave Zeus for children. Ares, the god of war. Ilathea, the goddess of childbirth. Hebe, the goddess of eternal youth, and Hapistis, the god of fire. Zeus tricked Hera into marriage, knowing full well that the goddess loved animals. He transformed himself into a distressed cuckoo and reverted to his original form. Only when Hera took the poor creature to her breast to warm it. Ashamed for being taken advantage of, Hera agreed to a marriage. However, it didn't turn out to be a happy one, Zeus was brutish and cruel to everybody. Incapable of bearing this, Hera plotted a revenge plan with Poseidon, Athena, and possibly a few other gods. She drugged Zeus and they bound him on his bed while stealing his thunderbolt. Thetis, however, summoned Briareus, the hundred-handed cousin that helped Zeus overthrow Cronus and had him untie the one hundred knots used to bind him. Zeus was merciless to the main schemer. He hung Hera from the sky with golden chains. And to grant herself a release, Hera swore never to rebel again against her husband. So she directed her anger towards Zeus' lovers and their offspring, becoming a jealous and vindictive wife. For example, 
she tricked Semele into forcing her lover, which she knew was Zeus, to reveal himself before her in all his glory. Since humans cannot look upon gods without incinerating, Semele burst into flames and perished into thin air. Later, she turned Callisto into a bear after she gave birth to Zeus' child, Arcus. After some time, just as Arcus was about to unwittingly kill his mother, Zeus placed Callisto and her son in the sky as the constellations Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, the big and the little bear. Hera kept her daughter Ilathia from attending the birth of Apollo, postponing it by nine days and nights. More famously, she did the same with Hercules. In this case, the delay cost Hercules the throne of Arglid. Arguably Io was the one who endured the most. First Zeus transformed her into a cow, so that he could hide her from Hera. Then, Hera sent Argus Panops to watch over her and Zeus, and then had Argus killed by the god Hermes. She then transformed Argus' ghost into a gadfly which bothered and pestered Io in her bovine form all the way to Egypt, where on arrival Zeus impregnated her with their son Apophis. Just like most of the other Greek goddesses, when it came to her beauty, Hera was easily offended. Once Orion's wife, sighed, meaning pomegranate, boasted that she was as beautiful as Hera. So the goddess sent her to the underworld. When Laundon's daughter Antigone did the same, Hera turned her into a stork. Finally, after Paris chose Aphrodite instead of her, she became a sworn enemy of Troy. But that is a different story for another time. Poseidon Poseidon is the violent and ill-tempered god of the sea. One of the twelve Olympians, he was feared as the provoker of earthquakes and tsunamis and was worshipped as the creator of the horse. A hot-blooded deity, Poseidon had many disputes with both gods and men, most famously with Athena and Odysseus. Poseidon's name is very old, and its meaning is lost to us. Various authors have tried to translate it as either husband of the earth or lord of the waters. Plato says that it means knower of many things, but this is much less likely. Poseidon is nowadays known exclusively as a sea god, but in ancient times, he may have been the god of the earth and fertility, or even the supreme god of the sky. In fact, in portrayals, he looks very much like Zeus, a distinguished, bearded man with dense curly hair and piercing eyes. Homer says that his shriek was as loud as 10,000 men combined. Oftentimes, he is depicted riding a four, horse chariot and wielding a trident over the waves. The trident is his most recognizable emblem, though his son, Triton, carries one as well. It is said that Poseidon struck a rock with his trident to create the very first horse, Scythios. During the Gigantomachy, the god used the trident to break off a piece of the island of Kos, under which he subsequently entombed the giant polyboats. The piece became today's island, Nyssa Rose. The mentioned Gigantomachy was the most important battle that happened in Greek mythology. It was a fight between the giants or Gigantes, sons of Uranus and Gaia, and the Olympian gods who were trying to overthrow the old religion and establish themselves as the new rulers of the cosmos. Since Poseidon had multiple powers, the ancient Greeks invented various epithets to describe his manifestations and pray to him. To some, he was the savior of sailors, to others the averter of earthquakes, yet a third group venerated him as the creator and tamer of horses, and to a fourth one he was the leader of the nymphs. Poseidon was the second son of Cronus and Rhea, after Hades, and their penultimate child before Zeus. Hestia, Demeter, and Hera were his sisters. Like all of his siblings aside from Zeus, Poseidon was swallowed by Cronus at birth and thanks to Zeus, 
afterwards disgorged unharmed. However, some say that Rhea managed to hide Poseidon from his father's rage as well. Either in a flock of lambs in Arcadia or in Rhodes, to be raised by Oceanus' daughter Coferia and the Telchines, who were the original inhabitants of Rhodes. After Cronus was deposed, the three sons threw dice for his empire. Zeus, the youngest, won and chose the sky. Poseidon smiled to himself because the sky was empty and now he could choose as he would have done if he had won. He chose the sea. He had always wanted it. It is the best place for adventures and secrets and makes claim on land and sky. Hades, who was always unlucky, had to take the underworld. The earth was held as a commonwealth and left to the goddesses to manage. Poseidon left Olympus and came to his kingdom. He immediately built a huge underwater palace with a throne of coral and pearls. He needed a queen and chose Thetis, a beautiful sea nymph, but it was prophesied that any son born to Thetis would be greater than his father. So Poseidon decided to try elsewhere. And Zeus had her marry a mortal man. The prophecy came true. The son of Thetis was Achilles. Poseidon chose another Nereid, or sea nymph named Amphitrite. And their son was Triton. Poseidon had a very violent character, impulsive and hot-blooded, he couldn't put up with Zeus' arrogant behavior as a ruler. So, he teamed up with Hera and Athena to teach him a lesson. However, with the help of Thetis and Briareus, Zeus overpowered his challengers. As punishment, he sent Poseidon and Apollo to serve the Trojan king Laundon, for whom they built the vast and beautiful walls surrounding Troy. However, when the time came, Laundon refused to pay them. As a result, Poseidon, even against the advice of Zeus, fought on the Greek side during the Trojan War by sending a sea monster named Cetus to torment the Trojans. Even so, the narcissist that he was, Poseidon destroyed the fortifications built by the Greeks, firmly believing that only his walls were worthy enough to remain. And, mad at him for blinding his son Polyphemus, he had a decade-long feud with one of the greatest Greek heroes, Odysseus. But that is another story. The god of the sea was also greedy, especially when it came to earthly kingdoms once he even wanted to obtain Athens from Athena, claiming that the city would have much more benefit from him than her. To prove this, he plunged his trident into a rock, creating a seawater stream which welled up in the temple of Erchtheon in the north side of the Acropolis. Athena, in turn planted an olive tree. Cecrops, the first king of Athens, decided that Athena's gift was more useful since it gave fruit wood and oil. Athena kept Athens. And ever since then, an olive branch is a universal symbol of peace. Just like Zeus, Poseidon had a weak spot for women, and much like him, he was not exactly loved back by them. However, what he couldn't acquire with romance and gentleness, he did with violence and craftiness. For example, he took by force both Canius and Medusa, who afterwards was transformed into a beast by Athena as a punishment for allowing this. After Perseus beheaded the pregnant monster, Medusa gave birth to Poseidon's children, Chrysa and Pegasus. To trick Demeter, who turned into a mare, to reject his advances, the god turned himself into a stallion and caught her. Afterwards Demeter gave birth to the nymph Despina and the talking horse Arian. The list goes on and includes hundreds of lovers and at least as many children. Amphitrite, a Nereid, was Poseidon's faithful wife throughout. She didn't want it at the beginning though. In fact, she fled to the Atlas Mountains to escape the god of the sea. However, Poseidon sent Delphinus to win her. Honey-tongued Delphinus did the job in flying colors. As a favor, 
Poseidon set his image among the star constellation Dolphin. Amphitrite bore Poseidon three children, Triton, Rhode and Benthesicine. The gods, Hestia. In ancient Greek mythology, Hestia is the goddess of the hearth, one of the original 12 Olympians, Cronus and Rhea's firstborn child, she was pure and peaceful. However, since she had to stay at home, tending to the fireplace, Hestia is not involved in many myths. Consequently, at a later stage, she would be replaced in the pantheon by the much wilder Dionysus. Hestia's name means half or fireplace, and her statue shows how important the half was in the social and religious life of ancient Greeks. Making and preserving fire was both essential and difficult for more primitive societies, which made the household fire a sacred element at a very early stage of history. In later days, Hestia became its embodiment. However, there are very few pictorial representations of Hestia. Usually, she is portrayed as a modest middle-aged veil-wearing woman. Sometimes, she stands by a large fire, carrying a staff or holding some flowers in her hands. The ancient Greeks didn't use too many epithets to describe her. Beloved, Eternal, and she of the public hearth were probably the most common. Hestia was the firstborn child of the Titans Cronus and Rhea, since she was also the first one to be swallowed at birth by her father and consequently the last one to be disgorged. Hestia was oftentimes called the youngest of Cronus and Rhea's children. She had two sisters, Demeter and Hera, and three brothers, Hades, Poseidon and Zeus. Since fire is a pure and purifying element, Hestia was worshipped as a virgin goddess, and they say that she remained a virgin in order to keep peace at Olympus. Namely, both Apollo and Poseidon wanted to marry her, fearing that marrying either man would cause turmoil. Hestia swore to an eternal virginity by placing her hand on Zeus' head. As a reward for maintaining the order and in place of marriage, Zeus granted her the central place in the house and the first and richest portions of all humans' divine offerings and sacrifices. Only once was Hestia's chastity subsequently put in danger. At a rustic feast, the drunken god of fertility Priapus tried to rape the sleeping goddess. Fortunately, a donkey started braying and woke up both Hestia and the guests who chased Priapus away in contempt. Ever since, Donkeys were rested and garlanded on Hestia's feast day. Gentle and peace-loving, Hestia doesn't appear into many myths other than these two. Plato says that this is because she has to remain in the house of the gods all alone, tending to the eternal celestial fire when all the other Olympians ritually pass in processions through the heavens. This is both her privilege and her predicament. Consequently, Hestia's only manifestation among humans was the crackling of the fire. Aristotle says that it is the sound of the goddess laughing. Hades Hades is the ancient Greek god of the underworld, the place where human souls go after death. When the Greeks buried their dead, they placed coins under the corpse's tongue and in the eyes so that his soul could pay the fare on the ferry. Across the river Styx, it was Charon who sold the boat. He was a miser. Souls who couldn't pay for the ride had to wait on this side of the river. Sometimes they'd come back to haunt those who hadn't given them the fare. On the other side of the river, there was a great wall. Its gate was guarded by Cerberus, a three-headed dog who had an appetite for live meat and attacked everyone but spirits. Beyond the gate in Tartarus was a great wide field, shaded by black poplars. Here lived the dead, heroes and cowards, soldiers, shepherds, priests, minstrels and slaves. They wandered back and forth aimlessly. When they spoke they twittered like bats. Here they awaited trial by three judges, Minos, Rhadamanthes and Iacus. Those 
who had particularly displeased the gods, were given special punishment. Sisyphus was made to push a huge rock uphill. Each time he would get halfway it breaks loose and rolls back down to the bottom, and he has to start all over, and he will do this for all time. Tantalus has been given a burning thirst, and set chin deep, in a cool clear stream of water, and every time he dips his lips to drink the water, it shrinks away, and he will remain like this while Sisyphus pushes his stone. But these are special cases, most souls had to wait in the field of Asphodel for nothing. Those judged to be of unusual virtue went to the Elysium fields close by, which were full of music and the brave, and who had the chance to be reborn again on earth, and they danced all day long and all night long as the dead need no sleep. And a special part of Elysium, called the Isles of the Blessed, here lived those who had been three times born and three times gained Elysium. Hades and his queen lived in a palace of black rock. He was very jealous of his brothers and scarcely ever left his domain. He was fiercely possessive, gloated over every new arrival, and demanded a headcount from Karen at the end of each day. Never did he allow any of his subjects to escape, nor did he allow a mortal to visit Tartarus and return. There were only ever two exceptions to this rule, but those are other stories. The palace grounds and the surrounding fields were called Erebus, and this was the deepest part of the underworld. No bird flew here, but the sound of wings was heard, for here lived the Arenes or Furies, who were older than the gods. Their names were Tisiphone, meaning avenger of murder, Alecto, meaning unceasing in anger, and Mogara, meaning jealous. They were hags with snakes for hair, red hot eyes, and yellow teeth. They slashed the air with metal studded whips, and when they found a victim, they whipped the flesh from his bones. Their task was to visit earth and punish evil doers, especially those who had escaped other punishment. They were greatly feared. No one dared say their names. They were referred to as the Eumenides or kindly ones. Hades valued them. They enriched his kingdom by persuading people to suicide. And he enjoyed the stories they returned to Erebus with. Hades was well cast to rule the dead, he was violent, loathed change, and was given to rage. As the ruler of the dead, Hades was a grim and ghastly figure, inspiring fear and terror in everybody. Consequently, he was rarely depicted in art. When he was, he was most commonly portrayed with a beard and a solemn, mournful look. He frequently wears a helmet named the Helm of Darkness, or cap of invisibility. Cerberus, the three-headed dog, is usually by his side. Every so often, he carries a scepter or holds the keys to his kingdom. At a later stage, he became associated with his weapon of choice, the Bident, a two-pronged fork modeled after Poseidon's Triton. Hades means the Unseen One. A suitable name since Hades is the ruler of an invisible world. However, the ancient Greeks rarely used this name, just like Christians rarely used the word hell during the Middle Ages. So since minerals and precious metals are found underground, they often referred to Hades euphemistically as Plauton, the wealth giver. Unsurprisingly, Hades, Roman equivalent, is called Pluto as well. As Plauton, he was sometimes shown with a cornucopia, the horn of plenty. Among the ancient Greeks, Hades was known as the other Zeus. Homer even called him the infernal Zeus. In addition to the grisly god, he was also called the host of many, or the attractor of men, since all men eventually went to serve him. Hades was the fourth child of the Titans, Cronus and Rhea, after Hestia, Demeter, and Hera, both the oldest and youngest male sibling, as he was the youngest of the three brothers, Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus, to be born and swallowed by his father, 
but the last to be regurgitated. After being rescued by Zeus from the belly of Cronus, Hades joins him in the Titanomachy. Eventually, the decade-long war ends with victory for the Olympians, and Hades, Poseidon and Zeus cast dice to decide who of the brothers will rule which domain. And Hades gets the underworld. Since Hades was a fearsome deity who rarely left his kingdom, there are very few myths about him in ancient Greek sources. By far the most important myth is Hades' abduction of Persephone, Demeter's daughter. That was one of the few times Hades traveled above ground. The reason naturally being love. He fell for Persephone. However, she didn't want to give in easily. So Hades devised a ploy as Persephone was gathering flowers with her maidens at the Nysian plain, he caused an indescribably beautiful flower to suddenly bloom before her. As she reached to pluck it, the ground around her opened up and Hades appeared before her, all dreadful and majestic in his four, horse, golden chariot, and took her with him to the underworld. Demeter, the goddess of fertility, was so distressed at the absence of her daughter, that she started fasting and wandering aimlessly. Finally, after nine days, Hecate told her what happened and after the all-seeing Helios confirmed the event, Demeter left Olympus in protest and the earth turned barren and infertile as a desert. After a year, Zeus sent Hermes to Hades with the request that he return Persephone to her mother, to which he complied but only after making her eat a pomegranate seed to bind her to his kingdom eternally. Now both sides had no choice but to accept Zeus' compromise. Persephone would spend two-thirds of the year with Demeter, but one-third with Hades. And this is the part of the year which corresponds with the winter months. And every spring would be reunited with her mother marking the season of rebirth. It's possible that Hades and Persephone didn't have any children. However, some say that Zogres may have been their son and Makaria is also claimed to be Hades' daughter, but no mother is mentioned. As the realm of the dead, Hades is mentioned ten times in the New Testament in its original Greek text. Older translations, such as the King James Bible, invariably translate it as hell. Demeter in ancient Greek mythology, Demeter is the goddess of grain and agriculture, one of the original twelve Olympians. Her grief over her daughter Persephone, who has to spend one-third of the year with her husband Hades in the underworld, is the reason why there is winter, and her joy when she gets her back coincides with the fertile spring and summer months. Demeter and Persephone were the central figures of the Eleusinian mysteries the most famous secret religious festivals in ancient Greece. Demeter's name consists of two parts, the second of which, Meter, is almost invariably linked with the meaning, mother, which conveniently fits with Demeter's role as a mother goddess. However, there are still debates over the meaning of the first part, D, which most scholars associate with, Gia, making Demeter, mother earth, Others, however, prefer to link it with Dio, which is a surviving epithet of Demeter and may have been in an earlier form, the name of one of few grains. Demeter is usually portrayed as a fully clothed and matronly looking woman, either enthroned and regally seated or proudly standing with an extended hand. Sometimes she is depicted riding a chariot containing her daughter Persephone, who is almost always in her vicinity. The goddesses, as they were endearingly called, even shared the same attributes and symbols, the scepter, cornucopia, ears of corn, a sheaf of wheat, torch and occasionally a crown of flowers. Demeter was known mostly as the giver of food and grain, or she of the grain. For short, Sito, however, since she presided over something as vital as the cycles of plants and seasons, the ancient Greeks also referred to her as Tesmophoros or the bringer of laws. 
and organized a women-only festival called Tesmophoria to celebrate her as such. Other epithets include Green, the giver of gifts, the bearer of food and great mother. Demeter was one of the six children of Cronus and Rhea, their middle daughter and their second child overall. Born after Hestia, but before Hera and her brothers, Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus. Just like all of her siblings, she was swallowed at birth and later, following an intervention by Zeus, was regurgitated by her father unharmed. Demeter didn't have many partners and was rarely portrayed with a male consort. The mortal Eosian and her brothers Poseidon and Zeus are the most noteworthy if not the only exceptions. Early in her life, she fell in love with a mortal named Eation. She seduced him at the marriage of Cadmus and Harmonia and lay with him in a thrice-plowed field. Zeus didn't think it appropriate for such a respected goddess to have a relationship with a mortal, so he struck Eation with a thunderbolt. But by then, Demeter was already pregnant with twins, Plautos and Philomelus, the former, the god of wealth, and the latter, the patron of plowing. Next, Demeter's brother Poseidon transformed into a stallion and forced himself upon her. And the goddess, once again, became pregnant with two children, Dispina, a nymph, and Arian, a talking horse. Finally, Demeter became Zeus' fourth wife. From their union, Demeter's most well-known child was born, Persephone. The most important myth involving Demeter concerns her daughter Persephone's abduction by Hades and Demeter's subsequent wanderings. Hades, the lord of the underworld, fell in love with Demeter's virgin daughter and decided to take her into marriage. So one day, as she gathered flowers with her maidens, he lured her aside using a fragrant and inexpressibly beautiful Narcissus flower and then snatched her up with his chariot, suddenly darting out of a chasm under her feet. Inconsolable, Demeter walked the earth far and wide for nine days to find her daughter, but to no avail. And then, on the tenth day, Hecate told her what she had seen. And Helios, the all-seeing god of the sun, confirmed the story. Demeter wasn't just heartbroken anymore. She was now angry as well, and with everybody, especially with Zeus, who had approved the whole plan and even aided Hades, after receiving a brand new and bigger thunderbolt weapon directly from the god of the underworld. So Demeter left Mount Olympus and went to grieve her daughter among the mortals. Disguised as an old woman, she ended up at the court of King Chelius of Eleusis, where his wife, Metanira, hired her to be the nurse to her baby son, Damophon. And Iamb, the old servant woman of the house, cheered her with jokes, and Demeter laughed for the first time in weeks. In gratitude for the kindness, Demeter devised a plan to make Demophon immortal, so she started bathing him in fire each night, thus burning away his mortality. However, one day, Metanira witnessed the ritual and not realizing what was happening, started screaming in panic and alarm. This disturbed Demeter's strategy, so she revealed herself at once and told Metanira that the only way that the Eleusinians will ever win her kindness back is by building a beautiful temple and establishing a festival in her glory. King Chelius did just that, and Demeter spent the whole year living in her newly built temple, grieving, and in her grief, neglecting all of her duties as a goddess of fertility and agriculture. As a consequence, the earth turned barren, and people started dying out of hunger. After being alerted to the problems on the earth by all the mortals' prayers, Zeus unsuccessfully sent all the gods one by one to Demeter with gifts and pleas, and realized that he would have to bring Persephone back to her mother if he didn't want to see humanity wiped out from the planet. So he sent Hermes to Hades, and the divine messenger fetched back Persephone to her mother. However, 
The gods soon realized that Demeter's daughter had already eaten one seed of pomegranate in the underworld, which obliged her to remain there. Having been tricked into eating the seed by a boy that Demeter had previously turned into a lizard, and was killed by an eagle and subsequently ended up in the underworld with Persephone. Knowing that Demeter wouldn't allow such a thing to happen, Zeus proposed a compromise. Persephone would spend one third of the year with Hades and the other two thirds with Demeter. The former, the period during which Demeter is grieving, corresponds to the winter months of the year, when the earth is infertile and bare. The latter, when she rejoices, overlaps the abundant months of our springs and summers. The myth, likewise explains the growth cycle of the plants. The grain, just like Persephone, must die and be buried under the earth, in order to bear much fruit above it. Demeter's Roman equivalent was called Ceres, which is where we get the word cereal. Ares. Ares is the Olympian god of war. However, unlike Athena, he represents merely its destructive capacity and is typically the personification of sheer violence and brutality. Consequently, he was loved neither by gods nor by men, that is, with the exception of Aphrodite, who bore him many children out of wedlock. Quite appropriately, Ares' name seems to have been an ancient word for battle or war. In art, Ares is usually represented wearing a helmet, a shield and either a sword or a spear. He drives a four-horse chariot and is accompanied by dogs or vultures. Sometimes, his sons Demos and Phobos are also depicted beside him. Unlike his nobler Roman counterpart, Mars, Ares was an unpopular god and never developed beyond the image of a divine battle frenzy butcher. Consequently, only a few epithets have reached us. Unsurprisingly, few of them are flattering. The bane of mortals, the slayer of men, the city stormer, the armor clattering, the arm bearing. Ares was the oldest child of Zeus and Hera. And, according to those who think that Hephaestus was born through Parthenogenesis, their only son. Either way, he certainly had two sisters, Ilathea, the goddess of childbirth, and Hebe, the goddess of eternal youth. Since he was the savage god of senseless war, Ares was almost universally detested. At one point, after Ares is wounded in battle by Diomedes, even Zeus calls him the most hateful of all the gods, remarking that if he hadn't been his son, he would have surely ended up in Tartarus with Cronus and the Titans. The episode with Diomedes is only one of many in which Ares comes off second best in his martial encounters. During the Trojan War, Athena needs no more than one stone to floor him, after which she spends some time mocking him and bragging of her superiority as a warrior. Heracles defeats Ares not once, but twice, first during the Battle of Pylos, and then after killing his son Cycnus. Most humiliatingly, Otis and Ephites, the Allodae, once managed to kidnap Ares and imprison him in a bronze jar for 13 months. Homer says that if their stepmother Ereboia hadn't told Hermes about it, this would have spelled the end of Ares. Ares had many women, but none of his affairs was as famous as the one he had with Aphrodite. At the time, the goddess of beauty was married to Ares' brother, Hephaestus, who was told by Helios of his wife's transgressions. Hephaestus fashioned a delicate, almost invisible, bronze net, which he put on the bed where Ares and Aphrodite were supposed to lie. When they finally did in his absence, he stormed into the room with the host of gods. The Olympians laughed for days at the helplessly entrapped lovers. However, it seems that in this case, Ares had the last laugh, since Aphrodite bore him at least three and as many as eight children. He seared lists only Demos, Phobos, and Harmonia. Later authors include Odrestia and some or all of the four. The Rotes, 
Eros Anteros, Pothos, and Himeros. Ares can rarely be seen alone on the battlefield. He is typically joined by a bloodthirsty crowd, a number of infernal associates symbolizing the terror of war. His sons Daimos, meaning panic or dread, and Phobos, meaning fear, are almost always beside him. The same holds true for Ares' comrade and sister, Eris, meaning strife, and Enyo, meaning the sacker of cities and sister of war. Sometimes, Kidoimos appears as well, the personification of the confusion and muddle of battle. Most frighteningly, so do the Kyrs, the grim-eyed female spirits of death, dressed in cloaks. Crimson with human blood, Ares was associated with many bellicose heroes in Greek mythology, such as the aforementioned Cycnus or Diomedes of Thrace, whose man-eating mares, Hercules, or Heracles, was supposed to capture as his eighth labor. Probably with his daughter Harmonia, Ares fathered a whole race of warriors, the Amazons. Otrera gave him the most famous four, Hippolyta, Antiope, Melanep, and Penthesilea. In recent times, Ares' name is used by a number of sports teams like the Greek football team, Ares Salonica. Ares' sacred animals were the dog, the boar, the vulture, and the serpent. Although the Romans changed Ares to the more noble Mars, his sons that never leave his side are still called today in the heavens as they were called then. Dimos and Phobos, the two moons of Mars. Athena. Athena is the Olympian goddess of wisdom and war and the adored patroness of the city of Athens. A virgin deity, she was also somewhat paradoxically associated with peace and handicrafts, especially spinning and weaving. Majestic and stern, Athena surpassed everybody in both of her main domains. In fact, even Ares feared her, due to the fact she floored him with one throw of a stone, and all Greek heroes asked her for help and advice. Athena's name is closely linked with the name of the city of Athens. The ancient Greeks debated whether she got her name after the city or the other way around. Modern scholars usually agree that the former was the case. In art and literature, Athena is usually depicted as a majestic lady with a beautiful but stern face and smiling, full lips, gray eyes and a graceful build, emanating power and authority. She is always regally clad in either a chitin or full gold armor. In the former case, she is sometimes represented with a spindle. In the latter case, she wears an elaborately crested Corinthian helmet and holds a long spear in one hand and an aegis in the other. At the center of her aegis there's oftentimes an image of a gorgon's head. Gorgonian, symbolizing the gift she got from Perseus, the head of Medusa. Just like Medusa's eyes, Athena's shield can also turn her enemies to stone. As a symbol of her wisdom, there's sometimes an owl flying in Athena's vicinity or sitting on her shoulder. From time to time there may also be a snake or an olive branch. Athena was one of the most important Olympian gods and she had many functions. Unsurprisingly, she was known under many different epithets. Some of the most famous were Virgin, Pallas, the unwearying one, the one of the city, the one with gleaming eyes, and the one who fights in front. It is often said that Athena had no mother and she was born out of Zeus alone. This doesn't necessarily conflict with this account, as the ancient Greeks believed that children were descendants of the fathers. While mothers did not contribute to the creation of their children, Athena was born in most miraculous circumstances. Metis was one of the Titans, a daughter of Oceanus and Tethys, therefore, she was considered an Oceanid. She was the first wife of Zeus and became the goddess of wisdom, prudence and deep thought. According to a prophecy, Metis would bear two children, the first being Athena, while the second one, a son, would be so powerful that he would overthrow Zeus like he did Cronus.
On learning that Metis next child may overthrow him, Zeus swallowed his first wife, who was already pregnant with Athens. When the time came, Zeus started feeling tremendous headaches. As even he couldn't bear them, Hephaestus struck him with his axe and lo and behold Athena leapt out of Zeus' head, fully armed and with a cry so mighty and fearsome that Uranus and Gaia were shaken to their bones with terror. Zeus was delighted and full of pride. As a child, Athena had a friend she loved above all. Her name was Pallas and she was all but her equal in the art of war. However, one day, as they were practicing some martial exercises, Athena accidentally killed her friend. Grief-stricken and in an attempt to preserve her memory, she added her friend's name to her own. That's why many people know Athena as Athena Pallas. Just like Artemis and Hestia, Athena was never swayed by love or passion. Consequently, she never had any children. Some say that Erichthonius was an exception, but, in fact, Athena was only his foster mother. True, Hephaestus did try to violate her, but she fought him off, so he spilled his semen over the earth, after which Gaia was impregnated. When Erichthonius was born, Athena took him under her wing, just like she would do afterward with another cult hero, Heracles. Poseidon and Athena had a much publicized quarrel over who deserves to be the patron of the most prosperous ancient Greek city, Athens. Poseidon claimed that the city would benefit more from him than Athena and to prove this, he struck his trident into a rock, creating a seawater stream which whirled up in the temple of Erechthion on the north side of the Acropolis. Smart as she was, Athena did nothing spectacular, she merely planted an olive tree. However, the first king of Athens, Cecrops, who was the judge of the contest, realized that the olive tree was much more beneficial, since it gave the Athenians fruit, oil and wood. Athena was a master artisan. As much as she was the women counterpart of Ares as a war goddess, she was also the female equivalent of Hephaestus when it came to arts and crafts. Homer says that Athena fashioned ornate and luxuriously embroidered robes for Hera and herself. Some even say that she combined her two main interests to invent the war chariot and even the warship. However, the most famous myth which connects Athena with handicrafts is the story of Arachne, a mortal craftswoman who boasted that she was more skillful than Athena herself. Athena offered her a chance to repent, but after Arachne refused, she challenged her to a weaving duel. The goddess fashioned a beautiful tapestry, which illustrated the gruesome fate of the mortals who had the hubris of challenging the gods. Arachne, on the other hand, chose for a subject the stories of the mortals unjustly victimized by the gods. She didn't even have a chance to finish it. Enraged and offended, Athena tore Arachne's fabric to pieces and turned her into a spider. As such, Arachne is doomed to weave forever. And that is why spiders are called arachnids to those who know them best. As a war goddess associated with wisdom, unlike Ares, who was associated with mere violence, Athena was often the main helper of ancient Greece's greatest heroes. Most famously, she guided Odysseus during his ten-year-long journey back to Ithaca, but she also helped many others, such as Heracles, Perseus, Bellerophon, Jason and his Argonauts. Diomedes, Argus and Cadmus were also helped. Homer's Odyssey is an invaluable source for Athena and her deeds. Hephaestus. In ancient Greek mythology, Hephaestus is the god of blacksmiths and fire. Called the celestial artificer, he was also associated with other craftsmen, sculptors, carpenters, metalworkers and, as evident in the name of his Roman counterpart, Vulcan, with volcanoes. Even though an ugly god, lamed by his own mother, he was the husband of none other than Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty herself. 
No one celebrated the birth of Hephaestus. His mother Hera had awaited him with great eagerness, hoping for a child so beautiful and gifted that it would make Zeus forget his heroic swarm of children from lesser consorts. But when the baby was born she was appalled to see that he was shriveled and ugly with an irritating bleating wail. She did not wait for Zeus to see him, but snatched the infant up and hurled him off Olympus. For a night and a day he fell and hit the ground at the edge of the sea with such force that both of his legs were broken. He lay there on the beach writhing in agony but unable to die because he is immortal. Finally the tide came up and a huge wave curled him under its arm and carried him off to sea. There he sank like a stone and was found by Thetis, the Nereid, or sea nymph. She kept him as a pet in her grotto at the bottom of the sea and was astonished to see how well he could craft shells and shine stones into beautiful pieces of jewelry. One day she appeared at a great festival of the gods on Mount Olympus where Hera noticed a beautiful necklace that Thetis was wearing that he had made, and inquired as to where she had acquired it. Thetis told her about the crippled child she had found and kept in her cave that makes the most beautiful items. Hera divined that it was her own child and demanded him back. Hephaestus returned to Olympus. There Hera presented him with a broken mountain, nearby where he could set up forges and bellows. She gave him the brawny cyclops to be his helpers and promised him Aphrodite as a wife if he labored in the mountain to make her wonderful jewels and weapons. To which he agreed as he still loved his mother and forgave her for her cruelty to him. He became the smith god, the great artificer, lord of mechanics, and the mountain always rumbled and smoked with his toil and still does to this day. It is not known what the name Hephaestus means. However, since it's similar to few pre-Greek toponyms or Phaestos, it is supposed that Hephaestus is a very old deity. He is arguably the most extraordinary member of the Olympian pantheon. Bearded and ugly, stocky and lame, he neither possesses the physical flawlessness of the other gods nor does he stimulate the fitting respect. Sometimes he is depicted with an oval cap and almost always with a hammer and an anvil. The epithets most commonly associated with Hephaestus are far from flattering. The lame one and the halting. He is also sometimes referred to as shrewd and habitually as the Etnean, since his workshop was believed to be located under Mount Etna. Hesiod, however, claims that Hephaestus is solely Hera's child and that she gave him birth by Parthenogenesis to get back at her husband Zeus, who had done the same with Athena. Later on, Hephaestus got his revenge. He made a golden throne, so beautiful that Hera accepted it right away. However, the minute she sat on it, she was all tied up by the numerous delicately fashioned cords invisible to anyone's eyes but their creators. Many gods tried to persuade Hephaestus to free Hera, promising him a place on Olympus in return. However, he was unremorseful and released his mother only when Dionysus got him drunk. Just like Hera's golden throne, Hephaestus' creations were masterworks. No one but him was able to build the beautiful, indestructible bronze mansions where all the other Olympians lived. Crafty and cunning, he added a distinctive element here and there, such as the secure doors of Hera's chamber which no other god but her could open. In the Iliad, Homer tells us something even more fascinating. Namely, that Hephaestus had fashioned for himself handmaidens of gold, who were able to understand him, speak to him and assist him. And they weren't the only creations of this kind, among other automata. Hephaestus sculpted golden dogs to guard the palace of Alcinus and Talos, and a giant bronze man to protect Crete. Some even say that, at the request of Zeus, he also sculpted the first mortal woman, Pandora. Finally, Hephaestus was the creator of some of the most stunning pieces of military equipment ever seen. Most famously, 
as a favor to Thetis, he created the shield of Achilles, whose five bronze layers he masterfully engraved with scenes representing almost all aspects of life. But he was also the one who made the scepter of Agamemnon, the breastplate of Diomedes, and the sword of Peleus. For an ugly god, Hephaestus couldn't have fared much better when it comes to women. Most commonly, his wife is said to have been none other than Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty herself. However, she wasn't very faithful to him, sleeping with Ares behind his back. One day, Hephaestus caught the lovers and trapped them in a fine woven chain net, after which he called upon the other gods to laugh at their shame. Poseidon persuaded him to free the adulterers, but Hephaestus wasn't done. When Ares and Aphrodite's daughter Harmonia married Cadmus, he gifted her a magical necklace, which would bring misfortune to her and everyone who will afterward wear it. Other authors say that Hephaestus was married to Aglia, the youngest of the Graces. She gave him for children, Euclia, Euthenia, Euphine and Philophrosine. One time, Hephaestus tried to force himself upon Athena. Athena managed to escape on time, so Hephaestus' seed fell on the earth and impregnated Gia, who afterward gave birth to Erichthonius, an early ruler of Athens. Hephaestus' sacred animal was the donkey, and his symbols were the hammer, the anvil and the tongs. Artemis Artemis is the Olympian goddess of the hunt, the moon and chastity. In time, she also became associated with childbirth and nature. No more than a few days old, she helped her mother Leto give birth to her twin brother Apollo. Artemis was very protective of her and her priestess's innocence. Consequently, she wasn't very nice when some of them weren't so careful. Even though Plato says that the name Artemis is related to her virginity and the ancient Greek word for unharmed or pure, we now know that its origin is undoubtedly different and possibly even Persian. However, scholars can't agree over its original meaning. Sculptors, poets and painters, however, had no such problems. Artemis is almost universally depicted as a young, beautiful and vigorous huntress carrying a quiver with arrows and holding a bow, typically wearing a short knee-high tunic and often accompanied by some animal, either a stag, a doe or hunting dogs. As a moon goddess, she is sometimes represented wearing a long robe and a crescent moon crown. Artemis is the daughter of Zeus and Leto, herself a daughter of the titans Chios and Phoebe. Angered by her husband's infidelity, the ever-jealous Hera cursed Leto to never give birth anywhere on solid earth and sent the mighty serpent Python to hunt her down wherever she fled. Zeus sent the south wind to carry her to the island of Delos, but Python swam after her. When she reached the island Zeus unmoored it and pushed by the south wind they moved faster than Python could swim. So on the island of Delos, Leto gave birth to Artemis while balancing herself on an olive branch. When Hera heard this, she prohibited her daughter Ilathea, the goddess of childbirth, of further helping Leto. This postponed the birth of Apollo for nine days. And who knows how much more time would have passed if the baby Artemis hadn't miraculously learned the art of midwifery and helped Leto finally deliver her brother. Zeus watched the twins on earth from Olympus and thought that their faces shone brighter than all others. Apollo giving off a gold light and Artemis a silver light. And Zeus knew that they were godlings and belonged on Olympus with the gods. So on their third birthday, he sent for them. He had Hephaestus make Apollo a golden bow with a quiver of arrows that never ran out. And a golden chariot pulled by golden horses but he withheld Artemis' gifts. Zeus preferred her and liked her to ask him for things. So what gifts would you like, young maiden, he said. 
I want to be a maiden forever, she replied. And I want lots of names, in case I get bored with one. I want a bow and arrow too, but silver not gold. And I want a tunic, short enough to run in, and twenty wood nymphs to hunt with me, and fifty sea nymphs to sing for me. And I need a pack of hounds. Swift, ferocious ones that can outrun any deer. Zeus not only granted her all the things she asked for, but let her choose all the items herself so that they would have more meaning to her. Even her chastity was optional, which made her defend it more. She went to Hephaestus for her bow, who sent her to his Cyclopes at the bottom of the ocean, who were making a horse trough for Poseidon. They made her bow and never emptying arrow quiver, and when their leader Brontes tried to sit her on his knee, she ripped a handful of hair from his chest and bid him good day, then rounded up all the most beautiful sea nymphs and left for the woods, where she selected the very best wood nymphs. Then she went to see Pan in the mountains of Arcadia where she took ten of his most ferocious dogs and ordered them to bring back a pair of deer unharmed. She harnessed them to her silver chariot that Hephaestus had just finished making for her and dashed off into the mountains. The first four times she fired her silver bow, she split a pine tree, then an olive tree. Then she killed a wild boar. The fourth arrow she fired into a city of unjust men, killing every single one before the arrow ceased its flight. And the people on earth seeing her ride across the mountains wielding her silver bow, with her maiden nymph following, gave her many epithets, or names, such as goddess of the moon, and the maiden of the silver bow. Others called her lady of the wild things, some called her the huntress and others simply the maiden. Therefore receiving her final gift, many names. Homer calls Artemis either the mistress of animals, or she of the wild, as a huntress, she is also often referred to as arrow pouring or deer shooting. Just like her brother, she may be occasionally called bright or, even more, illustrative of her function as a moon goddess, torch bringer. Artemis and Apollo were very protective of their mother. When Niobe, a mother of six boys and as many girls, boasted that while Leta gave birth to only two gods, she had delivered a whole Olympus. So, Apollo and Artemis killed all her children. Apollo took care of the male offspring and Artemis of Niobe's daughters. On another occasion, Titus tried to force himself upon Leto. Naturally, he was killed by Apollo's and Artemis's arrows. When Artemis was still a little maid, she asked from her father Zeus to keep her maidenhood forever. So, just like Athena and Hestia, she remained chaste for eternity. And she guarded this vow even more vigorously than them. For example, when the hunter Actaeon saw her bathing naked, she transformed him into a stag and set her hounds against him. Needless to say, Actaeon was ripped apart into many pieces. The less famous Saproites was just a boy when he had Actaeon's misfortune of accidentally seeing the goddess unclothed. So, he was punished less severely, Artemis transformed him into a girl. Others tried to rape Artemis, none of them lived to tell the tale. The most famous story involves Orion, a long-time hunting companion of hers. In fact, he may as well have been Artemis' only love interest, however, when he tried taking off Artemis' robe, the goddess killed him. Others say that Orion was actually killed by a scorpion sent by Gear, or an Apollo's arrow. The gods merely tried to keep Artemis' virginity intact, the only time she couldn't. Artemis didn't only take care of her own purity, she also defended the innocence of her worshippers, and was merciless if any one of her priestesses ever lost it. For example, after her hunting attendant, Callisto, gave birth to Zeus' son Arcus, Artemis contrived with Hera to turn her into a bear. The plan was to have Arcus kill her. However, just as that was about to happen, 
Zeus placed both of them into the heavens as the constellations Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. The Big and Little Bear Just as she punished the transgressors of the sacred vow, Artemis rewarded those who kept it. So as to devote himself to a chaste life, Hippolytus scorned Aphrodite after which the goddess of love made his stepmother fall in love with him. This set a chain of events which led to Hippolytus' death. However, Artemis called upon Asclepius and resurrected Hippolytus as a new man, who subsequently ruled in Italy under the name of Verbius. In the case of Iphigenia, Artemis substituted the girl with a deer just as Iphigenia was about to be sacrificed by her father, Agamemnon. Afterward, she took Iphigenia with her in Taurus and made her a priestess of her cult. Apollo Apollo is the Olympian god of the sun and light, music and poetry, healing and plagues, prophecy and knowledge, order and beauty, archery and agriculture. An embodiment of the Hellenic ideal of Kalakagathia, he is harmony, reason and moderation personified, a perfect blend of physical superiority and moral virtue. A complex deity who turns up in art and literature, possibly as often as Zeus himself, Apollo is the only major god who appears with the same name in both Greek and Roman mythology. The origin of the name Apollo is still not properly understood. Many Greeks seem to have supposed that it stands for destroyer, but this was only one of the many suggestions. Redemptory, purifier, assembler, and stony. Modern scholars disagree with most of them, with the majority linking Apollo's name to the Greek word, apella, which means a sheepfold, and which may suggest that Apollo was originally merely a protector of the flocks and herds. However, in time, he evolved to become a multifaceted god, adored all over Greece as the perfectly developed classical male nude, the Kouros. Beardless and athletically built, he is often depicted with a laurel crown on his head and either a bow and arrow or a lyre and plectrum in his hands. The sacrificial tripod, representing his prophetic powers, was another common attribute of Apollo. Just as few animals linked with the god in various myths, wolf, dolphin, python, deer and swan. Apollo was in charge of so many things that, naturally, even his more famous epithets are numerous. As a sun god, he was called Phoebus, or Bright. As a prophet, the Greeks called him Luxius, or the one who speaks crookedly. As the god of music, he was known as the leader of the muses. Finally, the places of Apollo's birth and worship adorned him with three other appellations, Delian, Delphic, and Pythian. Apollo is the son of Zeus and Leto. As one of the numerous Zeus lovers, his mother incurred the wrath of Hera, who sent the mighty serpent, Python, to pursue Leto throughout all lands and forbade her to give birth anywhere on solid earth. Nobody would accept a pregnant Titaness, except for the island of Delos, where Leto first delivered Artemis while balancing her body on an olive branch. Afterward, Artemis helped her mother deliver Apollo as well. Fed exclusively with nectar and ambrosia, in merely four days Apollo grew strong and hungry for revenge. So, when he received his golden bow from Hephaestus, he went straight away to Parnassus where Python lived and wounded the monster with his arrows. Python managed to escape and shelter itself at Gia's ancient sanctuary in Delphi in a cave that could not be entered. So Apollo blew on his arrows and fired them into the cave, each one bursting into flames on entering the cave and smoking Python out to where Apollo filled it with so many arrows, it looked like a porcupine. The sun god was so enraged that he dared to violate the sanctity of the site by staining it with Python's blood. Zeus ordered Apollo to cleanse himself after which he returned to Delphi and claimed the shrine to his name. After these events, Dallos and Delphi became sacred sites for the worship of Zeus, Leto Artemis, and, especially, Apollo. 
The high priestess Pythia presided over the temple of Apollo at Delphi, serving as its enigmatic oracle, and annual games were held there, named after his great victory as the Pythion Games, and he named all his priestesses Pythonesses. The day he was born, Hermes invented the lyre and stole Apollo's cattle, so as to appease his older brother after he found out what happened. Hermes offered Apollo his new invention. Ever since then, the lyre became one of Apollo's most famous attributes and its most celebrated master. However, Apollo's virtuosity would be challenged on at least three different occasions. The first one to dare do such a thing was the least fortunate one, the satyr Marsyans. He wasn't bad at all playing the Aulos, the double flute, even equaling Apollo's skill. However, he ultimately lost the contest when Apollo said, now you must play your instrument upside down and sing while you play. Since, unlike Apollo, he couldn't sing while playing. As punishment, Marsyas was hanged inside a cave and was subsequently flayed alive. He then nailed his skin to a tree. A stream gushed from the tree's roots and became a river, on the banks of that river grew reeds which sung softly when the wind blew, and the people called the river, Marsyas, and that is still its name today. Fortunately for him, Pan survived unscathed after challenging Apollo and almost unanimously losing the contest. Midas, however, the only judge who deemed that Pan was the better player, got what he deserved, ass's ears, since he obviously lacked human ears for music in the first place, Apollo was of the opinion they'd suit him best. Sinuris, the king of Cyprus and a great flute player, didn't learn anything from these two episodes. After losing his contest against Apollo, he was either killed by the god or committed suicide. The story to this isn't clear, but what is clear is that the king did not survive. Apollo was loved by both gods and humans, women and men, and, more often than not, he loved them back as well. However, as it often happens, the most famous of his love affairs are the ones which didn't end well. All crows were white back then. They were good lookouts and quick to tell tales. On two occasions, the mortal got the better of the god. Coronis was already pregnant with Apollo's son, Asclepius, when she fell in love with Ishis. A white crow informed Apollo of this affair which enraged Apollo so much that although he couldn't bring himself to kill her, he ordered Artemis to kill Coronis for him, which she did with one arrow, and scorned the crow so ferociously. His words scorched the feathers of the crow, and crows have been black ever since. After a while, Apollo fell in love with Marpessa. Her lover Idas had already been through hell to get her, even risking his own life while abducting her. But he didn't back down, even in front of Apollo, raising his bow and threatening him with an attack. Zeus stopped this fight and gave Marpessa the chance to choose. She chose Idas, since she feared that Apollo would stop loving her once she grows old. In an attempt to seduce her, Apollo gifted Cassandra, the Trojan princess, the gift of prophecy. However, afterwards she backed out of the deal. Now, being a god, Apollo wasn't allowed to recall his gift. But, he thought of a cunning idea to spoil it, he took away Cassandra's powers of persuasion. Ever since, nobody believes her. Even though her prophecies are always right. Apollo's most famous love interest was Daphne, a nymph who had once vowed to Artemis to remain eternally innocent. Apollo, however, fell for her and persistently stalked her, until one day Daphne couldn't take it no more. She asked from her father, the river god Peneus, to be transformed into something else. And just as Apollo was about to embrace her, she was transformed into a laurel tree. The god swore to love her forever and, ever since, he wears a laurel wreath as a token of his unhappy love. Both of Apollo's 
most beloved male lovers were transformed into plants as well. After Cyparissus accidentally killed his pet deer, which was gifted to him by Apollo, he asked his divine lover to let him be sorrowful forever. So, Apollo unwillingly transformed Cyparissus into a cypress tree. The story of Hyacinthus is even sadder. He was a favorite of Apollo, and he dearly loved the god back. This made Zephyrus, the west wind, a Hyacinthus admirer himself, so jealous that when the pair was practicing sport in the fields, he made Hyacinthus discus swerve back and mortally wound him on the head. However, Apollo didn't allow Hades to take all of Hyacinthus to his realm. Out of his spilled blood, the god created a flower which bears his lover's name to this day. The Hyacinth. Apollo appears throughout most of the Greek literature. Three of the Homeric hymns are dedicated to him. The 21st and the 25th are short ones, but the third is fairly long and beautiful. In Ovid's Metamorphosis, you can find poetic accounts of Apollo's love affairs with Daphne, Coronis, and Hyacinthus, as well as one of his musical contests with Pan. Aphrodite. Aphrodite is the Olympian goddess of love, beauty, sexual pleasure, and fertility. So there are more stories told about her than anyone else. Being what she is, she enters other stories, and such as the power of her magic girdle that he who even speaks her name falls under her spell, and unlike other Olympians, is never distracted from her duties. Her work is her pleasure, her profession her hobby, she thinks of nothing but love and nobody expects more of her. She is regularly attended by a few of her children, the Erotes, who are capable of stirring up passion in both mortals and gods at the goddess's will. Portrayed as both insatiable and unattainable, Aphrodite was born out of the primal murder, when Cronus butchered his father, Uranus, with the scythe that his mother had given him. He flung the dismembered body off Mount Olympus and into the sea, where it floated near the coast of Cythera, out of the foam, that Uranus castrated genitals created when they fell into the sea arose a fully grown and naked Aphrodite, more beautiful than anyone before her or since. Even though married to Hephaestus, she had affairs with all Olympians, except Zeus and Hades, most famously with Ares, the god of war. She also had famous romances with two mortals, Anchises and Adonis. Aphrodite's name is usually linked to the ancient Greek word for seafoam or aphros, which fits nicely with the story of her birth. However, modern scholars think that both Aphrodite and her name predates ancient Greece and that the story actually came because of the goddess's name. If Apollo represented the ideal of the perfect male body to the Greeks, Aphrodite was certainly his most appropriate female counterpart. Beautiful and enchanting, she was frequently depicted nude, as a symmetrically perfect maiden, infinitely desirable, and as infinitely out of reach. She was sometimes represented alongside Eros and with some of her major attributes and symbols, a magical girdle and a shell, a dove or a sparrow, roses and myrtles. Once, during an important religious festival, the Hetera, Phryne, decided to swim naked in the sea. The famous painter, Apelles, was so overwhelmed by the exquisite sight that he drew the most famous, now lost painting of the ancient world, Aphrodite rising from the sea. Many artists have tried recreating it during the centuries past. The sculptor Praxiteles had a bit more luck than Apelles. He also modeled his most celebrated sculpture of Aphrodite after Phryne, but a copy of that sculpture has survived to this day. It is one of the first life-sized female nudes in history. Plato says that when Aphrodite saw the sculpture, alas, said she, where did Praxiteles see me naked? Worshipped by basically everybody, Aphrodite, the one who rises from the sea was appropriately called Pondimos. Of all the people, however, 
She was also called Urania or Heavenly. So some Greek moralists tried to make a distinction between these two Aphrodites, claiming that Aphrodite Pondemos is the goddess of sexual desire and Aphrodite Urania, the one of platonic love. Now we know that this was the same goddess, called by numerous other contradictory epithets as well, which often describe the complex nature of love, smile loving, merciful, and the one who postpones old age, but also unholy, the dark one, and the killer of men. Homer and Hesiod tell two different stories about the origin of Aphrodite. According to the former, Aphrodite was the daughter of Zeus and the Titaness Diona, thus making her a second generation goddess, much like most of the Olympians. However, Hesiod retells the much more famous myth. According to him, Aphrodite was born when Uranus' genitals fell into the sea after he was castrated by his son Cronus. The goddess of love emerged from the waters on a scallop shell, fully grown, nude, and more beautiful than anything anyone had ever seen before or since. Aphrodite was so lovely that only the three virgin goddesses, Artemis, Athena, and Hestia, were immune to her charms and power. Unsurprisingly, the second she got on Olympus, she inadvertently wreaked havoc amongst the other gods, each of whom instantly wanted to have her for himself. So as to prevent this, and being pestered by his ever-jealous wife Hera, Zeus hurriedly married her to Hephaestus, the ugliest among the Olympians. Of course, this merely alleviated the problem, as Aphrodite didn't plan to remain faithful. So, she started an affair with someone as destructive and as violent as herself, Ares. But Helios, however, saw them and informed Hephaestus, after which the upset and angry god made sure to devise a fine bronze net, which ensnared the couple the next time they lay together in bed. To add insult to injury, Hephaestus called upon all the other gods to laugh at the adulterers and freed them only after Poseidon agreed to pay for their release. Poor Hephaestus. He couldn't have known that when Poseidon saw Aphrodite naked, he fell in love with her all over again. He must have found out later, since Aphrodite gave Poseidon at least one daughter, Rhode, and she didn't give up on Ares either. In fact, after the bronze net scandal, she bore the god of war as many as eight children. Demos, Phobos, Harmonia, Odrestia and the four Erotes. Eros and Teros, Pothos and Himeros. Hermes didn't have many consorts, but he did have Aphrodite at least once, as the very name of their offspring, Hamaphrodites, suggests. And if we take into account that, Priapus is usually considered a son of Dionysus and Aphrodite. It seems that only Zeus and Hades managed to never fall for the goddess of love. But the second one didn't even live on Olympus, and the former may have been her father. When she wasn't busy making other people fall in love, Aphrodite had some time to fall in love herself. Once, she took a baby boy she had found beside a moor tree to the underworld, and asked Persephone to take good care of him. However, when she went to visit him after many years, she instantly fell in love with the now unusually handsome mortal. So, she asked to have Adonis back, for that was the boy's name. Persephone wouldn't allow this. Zeus settled the quarrel by dividing Adonis' time between the two goddesses. However, Adonis preferred Aphrodite, and when the time came, he didn't want to go back to the underworld. So Persephone sent a wild boar to kill him, and Adonis bled to death in Aphrodite's arms. Anemones sprang out of the tears of Aphrodite while she was mourning the death of her lover. The couple had two children, Bero and Golgos. Another time, Aphrodite fell for a Trojan prince called Anchises. Pretending to be a princess herself, she seduced him and slept with him. Only afterwards she revealed herself, 
promising him a noble son and warning him to keep the affair to himself. Anchises wasn't able to, so he was struck by Zeus' thunderbolt, which blinded him. And he wasn't able to see his son, Aeneas, who went on to found the mighty Roman Empire. Paris was the third and final mortal who was blessed with seeing Aphrodite naked. This happened when he was tasked with judging who of the three goddesses, Aphrodite, Hera, or Athena was the fairest. Aphrodite promised Paris the most beautiful mortal girl in the world, if he chose her. So naturally, he did. Aphrodite made sure that he got Helen, the Spartan queen, an event which triggered the bloody, decade-long Trojan War. Few dared to resist the power of Aphrodite, and she had mercy for none of them. Hippolytus preferred Artemis to her and vowed to eternal innocence. Aphrodite made his stepmother, Phaedra, fall in love with him, which resulted in the death of both her and Hippolytus. After Aphrodite found out that Aeos had slept with Ares, she cursed her to be perpetually and unhappily in love. Diomedes wounded the goddess during the Trojan War, and suddenly his wife, Ego, started sleeping around with his enemies. Psyche would have gone through an even worse ordeal, but, fortunately for her, Eros, Aphrodite's avenger, shot himself instead of her and fell in love with Psyche instead. But that is a different story. Few poems are more beautiful than Lucretius' invocation of Aphrodite at the beginning of On the Nature of Things. Compare this to the longest of the three Homeric hymns dedicated to Aphrodite, the fifth one. Finally, Aphrodite is a constant companion of Aeneas in Virgil's Aeneid. When Aphrodite first stepped on the island of Cythera after her birth, the sand turned to grass and flowers bloomed. Then she went to Cyprus, where the hillsides burst into flowers and the sky was full of birds. And from her name, the word we use for inducing sexual desire is Aphrodisiac. Aphrodite's Roman counterpart was Venus. Hermes. Hermes is the winged herald and messenger of the Olympian gods. In addition, he is also a divine trickster and the god of roads, flocks, commerce, gambling and thieves. A precocious newborn, he invented the lyre and stole Apollo's cattle on the very first day of his life. Hermes was the only Olympian capable of crossing the border between the living and the dead. Most scholars think that Hermes' name derives from the Greek word Herma, which means a heap of stones or cairn. Cairns were a common sight in the ancient world, serving as trail or boundary markers. Some say that the first cairn was erected by the gods when they cast all their stones in favor of Hermes during his trial for slaying Argus Panops. Archaic artists portrayed Hermes as a mature bearded man. However, later on, he was represented as an athletically built nude youth, immediately recognizable by four attributes, a broad brimmed hat, patassos, winged sandals, Talaria, a purse, and a herald's wand, Karaikian, or Caduceus in Latin. Hermes wand, a short winged staff, entangled by two identical serpents, had magical powers, bringing sleep upon people or rousing them from it. It is very similar and frequently confused with the rod of Asclepius, which is why Hermes wand is often incorrectly used as a symbol of medicine. According to some myths, Hermes wasn't only a messenger of the gods, but also the inventor of speech. As such, he is often associated with oratory or interpretation. In Greece, an interpreter was called Hermenius, and today the science of interpretation is known as hermeneutics. Hermes was the only Olympian capable of crossing the boundary between the living and the dead and carrying the souls of the dead to Hades. In time, he came to be known as the conductor or the leader of souls. People also called him patron of travelers and thieves, shepherd of men, trickster, and Argus slayer. Hermes was the son of Zeus and Maia, 
the oldest of the seven Pleiades. He was born in a cave in Mount Selene in Arcadia at dawn. By noon he was able to invent the lyre and play a hymn, celebrating his own birth on it. That very same evening, for reasons unknown, he stole the cattle of Apollo. Afterward, he came back and innocently tucked himself up in his cradle. To invent the lyre, Hermes killed a tortoise and scooped the flesh out of its shell. Then, honoring the Pleiades, he stretched seven strings of sheep gut over the empty shell. Once he found out who had stolen his cattle, Apollo was so angry at Hermes that bad things might have happened if Hermes hadn't appeased Apollo with a lyre-accompanied song. In exchange for it, Apollo forgave his little brother everything and swore to be his closest friend forevermore. Some say that as a token of this promise, Apollo gifted Hermes with the latter one's most emblematic object, the Caduceus. By all accounts, Hermes was a darling of the gods. Artemis supposedly taught him how to hunt and Pan how to play the pipes. He was the one who guided Persephone back to her mother, Demeter. Above all, Hermes was very close with his father, acting in many of his affairs as Zeus wingman. Most famously, he beheaded the hundred-eyed giant Argus Panops, previously sent by Hera to closely watch over Zeus' love interest, Io. In his role as a messenger, Hermes is present in numerous other myths. He escorts Pandora to Epimetheus, leads Perseus to the Greek, and guides Priam safely to Achilles' tent. In addition, he showed Athena, Aphrodite, and Hera the way to Mount Ida where Paris was supposed to judge which one of them was the fairest. Even though associated with fertility, it seems that Hermes never married and had relatively few famous consorts and children. Aphrodite bore him hermaphrodites and possibly Tige. Hers, Cephalus and the nymph Dryope. Pan, later poets, sometimes link Hermes with Pitho or Hecate. Once Hermes and Apollo fell in love simultaneously with the virgin Keone and slept with her on the very same day. Later, Keone gave birth to twins. Philammon took after Apollo and became a famous musician. Unsurprisingly, Hermes' son Autolycus became a trickster and a thief. Poets say that few of his traits were inherited by his grandson, Odysseus. Hermes' Roman counterpart is Mercury, the god of financial gain, commerce, and messages. The fourth Homeric hymn is dedicated solely to Hermes and retells his childhood in length. In Lucian's Dialogues of the Gods, there are few imagined interchanges between Hermes and other gods 3, 14, 15, 21, 24 which, now that you know Hermes better, will certainly make you laugh. A brief preview, in the 24th dialogue, Hermes amusingly complains to his mother about the amount of work he has on his plate on a daily basis. Dionysus Dionysus was the god of fertility and wine, later considered a patron of the arts. He created wine and spread the art of viticulture. He had a dual nature, on one hand, he brought joy and divine ecstasy, or he would bring brutal and blinding rage, thus reflecting the dual nature of wine. Dionysus and his followers could not be bound by fetters. Dionysus was the son of Zeus and Semele, and he was the only god with a mortal parent. Zeus went to Semele in the night, unseen by human eyes, but could be felt as a divine presence. Semele was pleased to be the lover of a god, even though she did not know which one. Word soon got around and Hera quickly assumed who was responsible. She went to Semele in disguise and convinced her she should see her lover as he really was. When Zeus visited her again, she made him promise to grant her one wish. She went so far as to make him swear on the river Styx that he would grant her request. Zeus was madly in love and agreed. She then asked him to show her his true form. Zeus was unhappy knowing what was about to happen, but bound by his oath, he had no choice. 
He appeared in his true form and Semele was instantly burnt to a crisp by the sight of his glory. Zeus managed to rescue the fetal Dionysus and stitched him into his thigh until he would be ready to be born. His birth from Zeus conferred immortality upon him. Hera, still jealous of Zeus' infidelity and the fact that Dionysus was alive, arranged for the Titans to kill him. The Titans ripped him to pieces, however, Rhea brought him back to life. After this, Zeus arranged for his protection and gave him to the mountain nymphs to be raised. When Dionysus grew up, he discovered the culture of the vine and the mode of extracting its precious juice, being the first to do so, but Hera struck him with madness and drove him forth a wanderer through various parts of the earth. In Phrygia the goddess Cybele, better known to the Greeks as Rhea, cured him and taught him her religious rites, and he set out on a progress through Asia teaching the people the cultivation of the vine. The most famous part of his wanderings is his expedition to India, which is said to have lasted several years. According to a legend, when Alexander the Great reached a city called Nyssa, near the Indus River, the locals said that their city was founded by Dionysus in the distant past, and their city was dedicated to the god Dionysus. These travels took something of the form of military conquests. According to Diodorus Siculus, he conquered the whole world except for Britain and Ethiopia. Dionysus saw Ariadne wandering on the coast of the island of Naxos, where Theseus abandoned her after killing the Minotaur. He immediately fell in love with her and married her. They had a happy marriage and Ariadne bore Dionysus' famous children including Enopian, Staphylus, and Thoas. Dionysus was also one of the very few characters able to bring a dead person back from the underworld. Even though he had never seen Semele, he was concerned for her. Eventually, he journeyed into the underworld to find her. He faced down Thanatos and brought her back to Mount Olympus. Dionysus became one of the most important gods in everyday life and was associated with several key concepts. One was rebirth after death, his dismemberment by the Titans, and his return to life was symbolically echoed in viticulture, where the vines must be pruned back sharply, and then become dormant in winter for them to bear fruit. Another concept was that under the influence of wine, one could feel possessed by a greater power. Unlike other gods, Dionysus was not merely a god to be worshipped, but he was also present within his followers at those times. A man would possess supernatural powers and was able for things he would not be able to do otherwise. The festival for Dionysus was held in the spring when vines would start bearing leaves. It became one of the most important events of the year and its primary focal point was the theatre. Most of the great Greek plays were initially written to be performed at the Feast of Dionysus. All participants, writers, actors, spectators, were regarded as sacred servants of Dionysus during the festival. Nones, in his Dionysiaca, writes that the name Dionysus means Zeus, Lim, and that Hermes named the newborn Dionysus this, because Zeus, while he carried his burden lifted one foot with a limp from the weight of his thigh. And Nysosin, Syracusan language means limping. Dionysus wandered the world actively spreading his cult. He was accompanied by the Maenads, wild women, flush with wine, shoulders draped with a fawn skin, carrying rods, tipped with pine cones. While other gods had temples to be worshipped at, the followers of Dionysus worshipped him in the woods. There, they might go into a state of ecstasy and madness, ripping apart and eating raw any animal they might come upon. His thiasis, a fennel stem scepter, sometimes wound with ivy and dripping with honey, is both a beneficent wand and a weapon used to destroy those who oppose his cult and the freedoms he represents. The god of wine and winemaking, passion and fertility, music and dance, Dionysus represented the spontaneous and unrestrained aspects of human experience. Known as Eleutherios the Liberator, 
Dionysus produced euphoric states that freed his followers from both the constraints of society and their own inhibitions. Wherever music inspired dance, wherever wine led to revelry, wherever religion sparked ecstasy, Dionysus was thought to be at work. Dionysus was adapted from religious traditions of non-Greek peoples in the greater Mediterranean world. Though he was recognized as a foreigner, Dionysus was still widely worshipped within Greek society. Perhaps more than any other deity of the Olympian pantheon, Dionysus thus reflected the extensive blending of different religious traditions in ancient Greece. He lived on in the Roman world under the name Bacchus, and aspects of him have survived in other Near East religions as well, including Christianity. Thanks for watching. Smithology. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and hit that notification bell for upcoming videos.